case discussion. I just want to start by introducing uh, our guest tonight. And I'll start with uh, Dr. Rochelle Bernacki, who's up here in the front. She's the Director of Quality Initiatives in the Department of Psychosocial Oncology and Palliative Care at dana Farber, and jointly appointed in the Division of Aging at the on Women's. She's a palliative care provider and geriatrician, and has devoted her career to improving the care of patients with advanced life-threatening illnesses. She's the recipient of two Geriatric Academic Career Awards from uh, HRSA to promote geriatric education for residents and medical students. Uh, Dr. Bernacki recently received the Partners in Excellence Award for her efforts to expand palliative care access to non-oncology populations at BWH. She's also the recipient of the Partners Healthcare Grant to improve conversations conducted with patients with serious illness, which is a project jointly administered with the Tool Gawande's Health Innovations Research Group at uh, HSPH. She's also my research mentor for the year and is an awesome, great mentor. Lots of good advising coming from her. Uh, I'll also invite our very special guest, uh, Margarita George. Very special. <laughs> Who's a social worker at Hospital uh, Aleman in Buenos Aires, where she works mostly with the transplant service. She also works at uh, Instituto Calium Latino America, a nonprofit organization which works to provide palliative care to patients and, edu and professional education to develop leaders in palliative care. She's visiting and working with the Department of Psychosocial Oncology and Palliative Care at Dana Barber, and is working on our study to, uh, looking at improving advanced care planning in patients with serious illness. So she's going to start by giving us a little bit of background on Argentina and the healthcare system there. Presentation for the Spanish. <laughs> Argentina. I don't know if you've heard about this culture of icons. <laughs> but well, before that, you know that Argentina is located in the southern part of South America. And this culture of icons, the first one, do you know him? Yeah. You must know him. Mm -hmm. The first oh. is the hand of God. <laughs> <laughs> the second one is the second hand of God. <laughs> The third one, the legs of God. <laughs> <laughs> also, we are pretty famous uh, because of the barbecue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard about that. No, it's not for vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> we can put some vegetables in there also. <laughs> that is the mate, which is a drink that we drink a lot. Yeah, most people who drink it here is what's this <laughs> that we are using. <laughs> and tango, which is very so, well, Argentina is a federal republic uh, organized in between 23 provinces and the city of Buenos Aires, which is its capital and largest city. According to the last uh, census of population and housing, which was carried out in 2010, we are about 40 million, but today it's about 42 million. So most of the people, 50% of the population, is concentrated in Buenos Aires, in the city of Buenos Aires. We were ranked as an upper middle income country, but due to several economic crises, mostly in the past years, many middle income families became poor. So officially, poverty is calculated at 9%, but I don't know if you have heard that official estimates are questioned. The credibility is serious question. Um, basically, in this matter, poverty and inflation and all these kind of measurements, private consultants measure poverty at around 22 to 26 percent, so there's quite a difference. Healthcare expenditure is about 8 of its GDP, which is, makes Argentina one of the countries of the region that spends more money in health. It doesn't mean that this is reflected in of uh, outcomes for many reasons, basically basically because of fragmentation of the system, of inequality among in provinces, and because spending more doesn't necessarily mean good investment, of course. So life expectancy was calculated at 75 years old, and general mortality rate 7.6. So according to the National Ministry of Health, the annual rate of specific cancer mortality in this period, 2008 and 2010, was around uh, 106 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. It is the leading 
leading cause of death in the age of between 40 and 64 years old, and the second cause in the age from 5 to 39 and older than 64. So the healthcare system here is like the most important thing of the day. Uh, well, the healthcare system, as I told you, is quite seriously and highly fragmented. Um, it is quite complex, and it's basically divided into three sectors. The three sectors are uh, all, uh, the Ministry of Health oversees all the three sectors, and it's the, they, they differ basically in um, providers, in the types of affiliation, and in financial sources. The public system is highly decentralized, and it's composed by a network of public hospitals and primary care. It covers all the poor population and uninsured population, and is financed by, basically by taxes and by social security beneficiaries that use public hospitals. So the second sector is the social security, or obras sociales, in other words, in Spanish, because it's hard to translate that. Well, obras sociales, it, uh, it, it includes the workers' unions, which are organized according to the occupation of the beneficiary, there are over 300 for the socialists actually, and it also includes the retiree health insurance. It covers all workers under the formal economy, under their families, and also retirees and their spouses and children and under 18 years old. So uh, it is uh, financed by uh, mandatory payroll uh, contributions of the place and the workers. And private sector that includes private providers, and prepaid health companies that have a wide range of different plans. It covers people with a very large capacity and of course it's voluntary and it's financed by the government of water. And often overlaps with other types of coverage, which is called double coverage. This is the case of anybody that has works in any place and has obra social and also want to hire a company for that. It is the healthcare system, but in terms of a bigger picture, as you may know, the, the economic uh, system is divided into public, private, private, and the social economy of third sector. Which we have to mention here the first health issues that provide uh, care and that uh, uh, as care providers in the public So, in terms of numbers, without counting the, the double coverage. Population. We have almost 23 million people with insurance and over 17 without insurance. This last number has increased in the last years because of the economic crisis, the increase of unemployment, and the increase of employment in this number. So for now, that's all. Then we will continue to the next one. Any questions up to now? For the people that don't have coverage, is there like a specific demographic that has, are less likely to have coverage, like farm workers or like unemployed or? Like for people who don't have coverage, yeah. is it like, people without coverage that usually, um, <coughs> the demographics of that usually, I guess it's, is there a specific demographic that has less access to coverage for insurance? 
for how far we? You mean the, the sorry because it's a little bit hard for me to understand sometimes. Uh, you mean with people with double coverage? People, yeah, without coverage. Ah, uh, without coverage. Uh -huh. uh, so who are, who, 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 who are those people? Yeah. Yes, may, people that don't, that are employed or that are employed in the formal sector. Okay, uh, people that don't have. They are not able to have, a, I mean, the different ways to access to some kind of health coverage is if you work in the formal sector, if you're retired, age retirement or disability retirement, or if you pay uh, uh, for uh, health content. If you're unemployed and if you are employed in the informal sector,
what is your understanding of what's going on? Um, with your belly pain? Well, first off, there's a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of pain right now. Um, I'm just kind of concerned because I'm just worried that might be something more serious. Like what? I don't know. You guys are the doctors. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, but my son was in Chile. Yeah. Very far away. Have you tried to reach out to him? I don't know. You know <laughs> there's not much communication. I try, uh, but I don't think he's forgiven me yet. I don't want to keep pushing. But back in G, maybe you want to like, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, yeah. but any yeah. thoughts about like, sort of your team's assessment? Like you got to ask some initial questions. Yeah. You know, imagine you're in the hospital, lots of consults coming in, you're trying to do like your <laughs> thorough but quick eval, like, yeah. I don't know, things you would add in. So this all sounded really good until like, in, like an ideal consult until this, uh, but I haven't seen my son in five years. But, uh, so that would be a big red flag for me to say, uh, this is a guy who's potentially really sick um, and we need um, to find out you know, does he want to talk to his son, or is that something that kind of they tried, you know, what's, what's kind of going on there? And is there opportunity here to sort of uh, maybe repair that relationship? Or, or, or is he so sick that we have to just let that go and sort of focus on what we can do at this point? So that's the way I think about it. Um, it sounds like from, you know, from a financial, socioeconomic standpoint, are pretty okay potentially, so that's good. Um, and in thinking about, um, uh, you know, eager to please people, um, yeah, I think it's a good, a good point of trying to get more information from the wife because sometimes they're afraid to sort of tell you what's really going on. So. Okay. Do you guys want to move on to the next part? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, right? So I mean, in terms of potential problems, and I think that maybe here we, we, we should see that the, the belief with his wife that her son, his son is far away, her daughter is far away from home. She's having a personal situation which you know, he wants to allow her baby to su support him at, at least at presence as much as maybe she would look like. So his wife would be like quite alone in care Yeah. Did you want to do you have one thing you want to so before we go on to the <laughs> next part of the case, Maggie's going to give you a little more background that'll help with uh, what's coming up next. <laughs> You know what, we talked a few minutes ago about coverage, okay? Um, well, liver transplant law adds, adds, adds something more to this picture. You know that according to the National Organ Transplant Law, patients with insurance will have the right to choose the transplant center they prefer. Why is it this? Mostly because uh, patients without insurance will go to the public hospital. And if there wasn't some kind of regulation at this time, many patients would end up in the public hospital and would be like more collapsed. Why may, many patients would be at the public hospital? Because imagine that transplant in, uh, the transplant uh, process, the state, Yes, it covers the cost up to the public hospital cost. Yes, the transplant, all transplant process has a budget, and the state will cover up to the public budget. Okay? If a patient goes to another place, private or another place other than public, the social security or healthcare company will have to pay the difference. The state will also cover up to that public cost, but we have, we have to pay the difference according to the different services that a private hospital or other hospital should have. So this is important because not many patients know they have this right, so they, many times we have to inform them 
healthcare for professionals like to inform patients that if they have insurance, they can choose a different provider only for transplant. So this would cover transplant evaluation, the basic back of studies. If there is anything additional, they will go to their provider and go with the results to the medic to the transplant team. Okay? The it would cover also the transplant itself, of course, and the follow-up. But if there is any disease progression or complications uh, that would hospital admissions or something different as the usual follow-up, they will also have to go back to their usual provider. This is Have I explained it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so another important thing is that in transplant, uh, follow-up will be less frequent along the, the, the years. Yeah, first it will be weekly, then monthly, and then sometimes every six months. So that's the situation. And, and, and a patient with a retired insurance or with social security in a transplant situation may choose a different provider. And do they choose because it maybe has better outcomes? Or? Basically because there is like more resources terms of, uh, for example, the, the, the biggest difference is, for example, if you need to have the pre transplant evaluation in a public hospital, it will really take you maybe months to complete. Uh, in a private hospital, you will have it in two days. So this kind of uh, situation may be maybe linked to the resources. If, if this happens, so say they go to private, like they go far away to a private hospital and then then they have some complication and they have to go back to their home place, then is there a disconnect between them? If they, yeah, if they don't live in, for example, if you're talking about Buenos Aires and they live in another province, mm -hmm. they usually the, the social security or obviously the healthcare companies which are like covers people with a greater earning capacity and all that situation, these, these problems won't happen because usually healthcare companies will cover almost anything. I mean, it's like more more more, more possible. But Social Security and Retirement Security will have these problems. If the patient lives in another province and she has like a complication, he may have obtained coverage, which is the most unlikely Situations, but most likely it will be referred to a hospital in the province. Mm -hmm. That is possible that if he, he has no problem to go to the province, that, that will happen. I mean, they will decide in terms of the better uh, outcome for the patient, but with much more limitations than healthcare. But the thing is that this is this is why a patient with a retiree insurance can be uh, transplanted in a private hospital. Go back and ask the patient or the patient's wife because their patient and family some more questions. You can do that as well. So why don't the medical team can start and then patient and family can go sort of second. So if you want to start, you can just start with like sort of how you answer your questions. It's fine. focus our discussion on uh, mainly if we thought that Prince Mike was the right decision for him, given that um, he was so confused now and uh, it's unclear what level of understanding of the transplant he had. Um, and then we sort of talked about um, this idea of transplant versus palliative care, whether or not they're mutually exclusive things, um, whether or not Thank you. 
thinking about some of the criteria that would go into thinking about this trans and um, and like his family support and if that was there, what would happen in terms of like him being considered a good candidate. Oh yeah, I could answer those questions. Uh, those questions are just not good. Well, we don't have any of those answers. Uh, Summarize maybe a little bit what we heard from this group. It sounds like this group was pretty concerned with like, yeah, how much did the patient want this? Because it was kind of unclear what this encephalopathy. But um, it sounds like the, the wife was like pretty sure what what she wanted. There is some concern um, about like how much information was able to be communicated to him, and if they'd be ready to ha and have the social support to sort of take care of this. What were you guys thinking? What was the patient and family like? What was your thoughts about? what you wanted to know, what you were worried about, what you valued going into this. Yeah, I think for us uh, a big concern was whether or not we can make sure that his like, long-term life goals would be met for him to be in a relationship with his son, um, whether this would actually, like what is the prognosis for the transplant, how functioning would he be, and like, what would he be dealing with, and how well we would be able to support that. Um, uh, we're also wondering what happened before because we thought that um, he got treated what was two years ago and he was supposed to be cured for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're concerned about like what um, what are the possibilities of what's going to happen. Like if we don't do a transplant, what's going to happen, or what are the success rates of the transplant and complications, and then also. Just some transplants, like what do we have to look for in the transplant center and all the complexities involved? Yeah. And we all brought up this word palliative care, and none of us know what that means, so we're really confused about that as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's save that one for the next segment. <laughs> uh, but it sounds actually like people are kind of on the same page, like the doctors are concerned about, and not sure, there's a lot of uncertainty in the room about like, what's the prognosis, was this the best decision, it's kind of unclear, and we were talking in our group, that like, with liver transplants, like it's, and any transplant, it's like, I don't, like hopefully it goes well, and you hope the person doesn't get like, graft first host disease, or like lots of complications, but a lot of times up front, it's really hard to make that prediction, like no one has a crystal ball. So I think that part of this, part of, part of what's hard about this is that uncertainty of knowing like, what's this guy's prognosis. Both people kind of want to know that, but no one totally knows, except that if he doesn't get it, his prognosis is definitely really bad. So we had a lot of like internal debate here, like what's this the right thing to do? And we're sort of like uncertain because of all those lingering questions. 
but then I think what you guys are saying almost makes it a little bit better, right? That it's, his life is definitely not good now. And even though it's uncertain, it's like, it seems like this is consistent with what he maybe has said in the past, and maybe it's okay to do Right, we're articulating the values that are important to him, yeah. which for him are the relationships. And so I think we try to be with the medical team to make the decision that will facilitate that and make that possible. For, for the sake of time, treatment part three. Yeah, unless any other last final comments on this part between the two groups or things you feel like you need to ask from the patient side or what you want to know about their perspective and vice versa? So what do, what do you know about, like, is, like, is his mental status actually reversible through a transplant? Or is you get, it what? Like, could you be like, will his mental status reverse and get better back to the way he was before with a liver transplant? Or is it like, Permanent, and you're just making it not work, not as bad. It should get better with a transplant. You don't know for sure that it will, but it's not going to get better if you don't do anything. Like unless you, if you try lactose, it's not going to get better. Okay, let's go on to part three. Second, perfect. I think the patient has lots to say. Okay, so this time we're gonna have the patient and family side go first. So maybe you can talk a little bit about some of your thoughts about how things went, what you would have liked to see different, uh, your perspective. Maybe you have some questions for the medical team about what's going on. <laughs> um, so we're really annoyed that like everything was going really well. I mean, we had more follow-up like more follow-up visits and stuff than we kind of expected. But once things started going downhill, like everybody just kind of seemed to not want us to be around. Like the public hospital doctors were 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 kind of like sent us home really quickly, <laughs> and the transplant team was like, we like don't feel like the transplant team supporting us at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we needed a lot of support. We called, like, we didn't understand what happened after the transplant. We didn't know what to expect in terms of the prognosis. Um, and then when we started applying, we wanted help to make sure that he passed more gently and less painfully, that we weren't, like, shuttling him to the hospital and then being sent back repeatedly. So it sounds like the patient is like pretty unsettled and happy with what happened. The medical team, your questions were really focused on like what kind of conversations. Um, now that we're sort of at this point, you know, if you could go back in time, like what would you have sort of wanted to say or do differently? What did you guys come up with? We felt like as a team, like we patient side, you guys thought a little bit about like other things that you would have wanted and reflect some of the things that the medical team sort of feels like they didn't help you out on. Could you guys talk a little bit about what you all talked about in terms of what you wished could have happened? Um, it would have been nice if there had been like someone around to help us through the whole thing and with us the whole time. Um, and definitely we didn't want him to end up like, I mean, our husband really died in pain, and we really didn't want him. Like, it was not nice. That was not like a. It was really hard for us to watch. And, and, uh, we don't really have much support to him after the back pattern. 
the thing about the communication, like we didn't know what to expect um, in terms of after the transplant, and then like once started deteriorating, we didn't know what was going to happen until like obviously when everything like went down the toilet, then we kind of saw that what was happening. But up until then, like it's like you get hope, and then you're like nurturing it, and then like, it's like it's crushed, and then now you're left like worse off than you were. And I think that um, we always presented a very, like, joyful face to you all, but that was just because we ourselves were kind of nervous about what was going on. We kind of had an expectation that the healthcare team would be the one to reach that conversation. So maybe, uh, medical team, what do you think, um, what were the bear? It sounds like you had a good plan about what you would have liked to have done. What do you guys think were some of the barriers to achieving that? So maybe I think like, as time is sort of wrapping up, it might be nice, Maggie, if you could maybe just give us sort of what happened after the patient passed away to give like an update. Yeah. And I think maybe the question we can leave people with is like some of the, like how do we kind of bridge the gap between these things? Like this was like not a great uh, death for this patient. Maybe Dr. Bernanke, you could give us a little bit of like, well, what could this have looked like in the States? And like, what would it, and I might you also maybe could conclude with the, your sort of more positive story where things really worked well for a patient? I personally will never forget this patient. It was really difficult. Personally, for me, it was actually difficult. And he was, well, he was, apart from the visible things, he was very nice and we really had a good relationship. The good thing is that I think that he helped us make some changes in how things, how, how to manage things. I think that sometimes it, it's more um, easy to talk about difficult or not difficult patients, but we don't usually talk about difficult or not difficult things. <laughs> Um, I think that trust was broken, that once that happens, it's very difficult to do anything. I mean, uh, not only because he wouldn't or she wouldn't answer the phone, uh, but anyway, I mean, she could have answered the phone and, and yet have been difficult because there was no more trust. So that, the first reflection maybe is to um, sometimes maybe doctors, uh, some doctors, who, um, like focus trust on, on cure. Uh, I mean, when that's not going to happen, that it, uh, like if treatment was equal to cure. And we, what we should try to do is to talk about the focus in care. And uh, if we make like that change of vision, it's like a totally different thing. Um, if the trust and the relationship is built, I think, in the care basis, then you can change plans and that would be difficult, surely, but not um, so dramatic. That's what everything is so central in the cure. Second, I think that quality of life should not be se separated from quality of death, because what's worse to say, oh, she, he had five wonderful years, quality of life, which is like the big flag of, of transplant, but if that doesn't go with a good quality of death and dying, I mean, you know, the taste is absolutely different, the experience is completely different. So, um, obviously, in, in, in 
first of all, we, we didn't function as a team. And after that, after that, we learned a little bit more about how to communicate first, not only with the patient, obviously, which is here is like very clear that that didn't happen well. But as a team, we we have learned we improved a little bit. I remember me, for example, knowing about the patient prognosis almost with the patient or after the, or I don't know, at the same time. <laughs> it was like, we don't share information, with, so if we don't have a good communication, we can plan anything. Um, obviously, if we communicate, plans change because uh, not only uh, obviously communication among the team, but first with the patient, the plan will be different, surely. Maybe, uh, maybe accepting the transplant, why not transplant? I mean, I, I always try to make clear that I think that transplant in many cases, I, I'm not a, a doctor, but I think it's a good treatment, but it's not against transplant but it's against uh, or it's uh, towards the idea of, of, of care. And it's like a long process. If it's trans, if it, if, it's, if it includes transplant, okay, but we should also plan uh, a little bit more forward than that. And um, palliative care is always time challenging. I mean, uh, obviously that, for example, in the NGO where I work, the situation is maybe different because we are like kind of the resource, uh, but we don't always work with little time, but this situation was even worse because, as, as we said before, and that's absolutely true, the care, care transition in these situations is really very difficult and most difficult because most hospitals don't have like a palliative care or inpatient unit or outpatient service. Um, what usually social insurance provides is home-based care but not, uh, that doesn't include palliative care professionals. So everything is like very difficult all these difficulties like came one over the other and it was like a mess. Um, actually, uh, after that, I, I think that I know we didn't do it in the case, but I could talk with his wife. And, uh, she came to the hospital to bring some medication that he, she had. And we talked about everything that happened. Um, she was more sad than angry. I mean, when she was angry, she was sad also, of course. But we could talk a lot. She couldn't talk with the doctors, although she wanted to, because it was possible. It is very difficult in the transplant, uh, for tra transplant doctors to, to face these situations. I, most of the times I find myself alone. And that I, 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 mean, I don't care to be alone there, but I think the patient needs, and this particular patient and wife needed the doctor. I mean, they were like very doctor-centered, and they needed uh, his information, his communication. And, uh, so, well, she could have a bereavement counseling and things like continue, obviously. But it was a very difficult case, as I told you, that I, personally I won't um, forget. And I think that hopefully, hopefully we, we could uh, make some little changes. Um, and hope, hopefully we will improve in the future. I've been very many times in the, in the like, period, uh, what, what am I doing here? Afterwards, and actually I'm more than, um, why not? <laughs> uh, 
And as I told you before, I think that it's good to try to, I mean, challenges are, are interesting. You, I think life is like that and you will, in your profession, you will, or you will find yourself many times in a place where you have to, like we did today, uh, think about potential problems, uh, actual potential problems, actual and potential resources and help the patient and the family and we kind of team together and try to focus on care uh, according to the patient's, the patient's values and, and, and goals and be there. Maybe if you just want to have any like closing thoughts or yeah, sure, thoughts. sure. So um, I mean, I think palliative care definitely could have helped. You know, either when he went to get his transplant, or um, you know, I think a lot of us fear um, doctors, nurses, social workers talking to people about prognosis and advanced care planning, but there's no evidence to show that it takes away people's hope, which was someone that was someone was saying. Um, there's absolutely none, and there's no the evidence to show that it increases anxiety. It actually shows that people get less aggressive care, better quality of life. So this is sometimes I, something I share with patients. They say, you know, by talking about this, we know that the, the, your, the chances of you having better quality of life and end of life, and for your family having better bereavement is the evidence is there. So we could do that. But one thing that I want to model, which is maybe even more important, is what Maggie is doing here, is to talk about mistakes, to, to take those patients that you feel like, gosh, I really didn't provide like as good of the care, the kind of care that I really aim to provide, and talk about them, because it's, it's very hard to do that. It's very brave to uh, kind of uh, uh, congratulate Maggie for doing that, and for modeling how to do that, because um, you really can learn a lot from it, and um, and to share it with other people by you doing it, other people will feel comfortable coming forward. And I think there's a lot we can learn. So um, I've been really impressed with Maggie, and um, um, and I really appreciate you sharing this story because it's hard to talk about those ones that really bother you. What could you do differently and learn from them and change? Thank you guys. So one yeah, yeah, yeah. quick thing that sometimes um, it is we don't have like the palliative care, we won't have a palliative care team, or, or sometimes it's, even though we, we may have or we may be in a palliative care team, sometimes it's not realistic to think that we will be able to be everywhere. But to, 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 to develop and, and share and, and, and work in these palliative care principles. Is like essential to every team from primary care to, to primary care itself. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.